I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I was, I was joking with Kasha. I said, well, you know, it gets dark early and people don't want to come out and they like to stay home and watch it on the computer and so forth. So I'm really quite happy to see all these, all these faces in the audience. And then for the number of friends that um, said that they were tuning in tonight, hello and thank you. And, um, and I hope that, I hope that what I share tonight comes out clearly. I'm a little intimidated now because I found out that some of the members of the Sangha from the Thich Nhat Hanh group are here. So, um, and I, I completely admire Thich Nhat Hanh. I, uh, part of the reason I got into studying the teachings of Nagarjuna was because of um, listening to him, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh speak about um, the prajna paramitas. And I love the way that he says, I'm a cloud. You know, and he talks about how he's a cloud and how he's connected to the cloud. And, and so um, the other thing that happened was the fact that I am I'm very strongly involved in the Native American community. And we have a teacher, he's a Potawatomi elder. And when he does the fire for our sweat lodge, he does it from scratch. And he brings grass, and he brings cedar, and he brings the wood, and he has this little flint thing that's a piece of stone, and he has this little cloth that he chars, and he makes this little spark, and the little spark catches onto that piece of material, and that little piece of material gets um, tucked into un unwound jute string. And then slowly, slowly, there's a smoke that starts. And that smoke, you know, once the flame catches, he sticks it into the fire that's built with all this grass and the wood and so forth. And every time I watch him make that fire, I think about the divine spark that starts our life. And that divine spark, is an, it starts for all of us. And it's, it just absolutely amazes me because I think about the fact that there's so much that has to happen for that divine spark to take place. There's so much interdependence that takes place. So that's part of, I guess that's the way I would like to introduce this because when you think about how much interdepend, how we are so interdependently related there is so much potential that we have within ourselves if we could just stop and just, just be there. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to start running through these slides so I don't talk the whole night away. Um, so Nagarjuna was, um, he, they don't have a lot of history on him, funny enough, but they do have the verses from the center. Um, he lived sometime around the second century in India. Um, and by some scholars, he's considered to be the most, if not um, one of the most important figures in Buddhism after the Buddha himself. And what's remarkable about Nagarjuna is the fact that he refuted the Abhidharma. And that's the scholastic teachings and the reworked discourses that many of the um, Buddhist teachers did after the Buddha passed away. They took all of his teachings and they kept on reworking it and so forth. And they came up with somewhat, um, I don't know if you could say, they're somewhat limited in the outlook. Um, it's a very set way of looking at Buddhism. And Nagarjuna didn't feel that that was, he, he didn't feel that that was the way that, um, because what happens is, is that when you get, too involved in the details of a teaching, it becomes almost doctrinated. And when it becomes doctrinated, then it becomes limited. And one of the Buddhist teachings is, is about emptiness. It, it's all about expansion, and it's about you know um, understanding, well, like I said, the divine spark. And where do we come from and this whole potential that we have? So he gave the Dharma teachings his own voice. And what he focused on was shunyata, which is emptiness. And that was after he studied the prajna paramitas. So he's, he is remarkable in his own way because he took his own path. Um, 
and he's the author of the Mula Madhyamaka, which is the verses from the center, which comprises of 448 verses. So shunyata is considered, um, it translates into emptiness. It also translates into zero and void, openness and spaciousness. And it's one of the most misunderstood concepts of Buddhism because, you know, it, it, everyone thinks that if you say emptiness, it means that there's nihilism, there's absolutely nothing, and that's not what it's about. It does not mean that nothing exists, and it does not mean non-existence. And it doesn't mean that there, what, it, what one of the teachings that they talk about is it means that there is no independent existence. Nothing can come from nothing. Everything is interrelated. So what happens is, is that when we talk about the fact that there is no inherent existence in anything, it really kind of, it stops your mind for a minute because the whole concept of God, where does that come from? You know, and, and the absolute itself, this whole universe, if you think about the universe, and last night I was with my um, elder and we started talking about how we're star people. You know, the, the whole cosmology, we're part of all of that. I remember once watching about this movie about how the earth was formed and how, you know, there's a star that dies and the stardust falls and it gets into the, into the soil of what becomes the earth and we eat the food from that soil, you know? And there's just this whole interdependence that takes place. And in turn, when you really sit and think about it, we're all star people. We all come from the whole, the whole cosmos is within our DNA. And it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I know that there's a lot of people who need to drink a couple of bottles of wine before they can try to even grasp this. But, you know, if, if you can sit and, I've always found that if I can sit and meditate in the morning on this whole concept and just like look out my window, I have that one second of ah. And it's absolutely fascinating. And I know that I'm not alone because I know that there's enough people in the world that have the same experience. So this whole thing about no thing comes from itself means that there could possibly be no, no like um, anthropomor anthropomorphic God. It has to come from something. There is no self because you can't, you can't say that this body is who you are. This body is made up a number of up, up made up of a number of different parts. In fact, Tim's last talk, I think it was the day before they closed for convention at the International Center, he was talking about how our bodies are made much more bacteria than anything else. There's all these little cells in our body that are working to be able to do whatever they need to do to keep our organs going and so forth. They all have their own little life. But are they, are they us? Can we claim that they're us? So it, it really is, it's, it's really a meditative kind of thing that one has to do with regard to the verses of the center. And the whole thing of um, Nagarjuna's teachings also refute absolutism, which is that there's only God, or nihilism, that there's absolutely nothing. So it's not one extreme and it's not the other. So there's, they never say that nothing exists but they refuse to say that the absolute is all that exists, that everything comes from the absolute. Because the absolute has to come from something, doesn't it? It can't come from nothing. So the middle way, one of the ways to explain it is um, liminality. And liminality, liminalness, is when you're kind of floating, and it's the moment between two thresholds. It's the moment between from here to there. It's that moment, it's that space in between. And it's that middle space. You're neither here, you're neither there. 
It's, it's sort of like neti neti. You keep on removing and removing and removing. And in turn, there's nothing to cling to. When you're walking down the middle of a path, there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to cling to. And that's what the teaching is about. It's about, not, it's about breaking away from the fixations that we've got within our mind. The grasping of saying, this is me, this is me, I am this, I am that. Or the attachments that we have. And that doesn't mean that because you don't, you know, you, you practice non-attachment that you don't love your children or you don't love your pets or whatever it is. It's just the sort of thing to understand that we don't own anything. You don't, I mean, there's a piece of paper that says you own your house or, you know, that kind of thing. But do you really own it? Do your pets really belong to you? I mean, if you really think about it, and this is sort of moving outside of the realm of the way that we normally think. It's moving outside of the conceptual understanding that we have of how the world works. So when you when you're able to get to that place where you really think about, you know, is this really the way it is? You kind of let go a little bit and you stop reacting to things so much. And you'll find that the mind sort of just calms down. And one of the things that the Dalai Lama talks about is the fact that if we practice this all the time, there'd be a lot less self-centeredness. He said the practical, the practical aspect of emptiness is the fact that we will, will stop being self-centered. So to Nagarjuna, emptiness is inseparable from, inseparable from dependent origination or contingency or interdependence. So meaning that there is nothing that comes from nothing. Everything comes from something. Everything is related. There's two truths that sort of work with all of this. It's the conventional truth, which is the one that we basically live our lives by. It's the one by appearance. And it's relative. We, we say that we know something. But there's so much more to know about one thing. You know, we can say that, um, I don't know, a lot of people say, you know, well, I, I know my children best. But we don't know everything about that one person. It's impossible. And, I, you know, I'll give an, an example of this. My daughter, when she was much younger, she went and got her braces taken off. And I remember that was one of the first, there's a, there's a whole concept about bearing witness. And it's where you, you witness another person's life. And I remember she went in to get her braces taken off, and she came out. And I wanted to be in the room with her. I wanted to experience that, that moment with her, because she had had these braces on for almost three years, and she was so excited about getting them off. And we went in, she went into the room, and I had to let go. All I wanted to, I was like wiggling in my seat. Oh, come on, let me in that room with you. No, Mom, I'm going to do this on my own. OK. So I had to sit there and just wait. And I, had to, and I basically had to bear witness to myself, and bear witness to what my reactions were and how I was struggling with the fact that I wanted to witness her life, and I couldn't do it any longer. So she came out, and I was like, OK, well, what was it like? Oh, it was, you know, it was a little painful, Mom. They tugged and tugged, and they had to scrape, and they had to scrub, and blah, blah, blah. But I wasn't there. So I cannot say that I know what it was like for her when she got her braces off. I only know what I experienced from my sitting in the waiting room. So when we say, oh, yeah, I know that person really, really well, we don't really always know that person as well as we think we do, because there's so many experiences that person has had we can't even relate to. So that's the conventional truth. That's the, that's the truth, that's the daily truth that we live by. It's basically by appearance. And then there's the ultimate truth. And the teaching is, is the fact that if we, can get, <coughs> if we can get to the understanding about how things within the conventional truth are empty, we can actually reach 
that ultimate truth. And the next slide talks about how, you know, for us, <laughs> I don't know how it is for the Dalai Lama, um, I don't know how it was for Nagarjuna, but, you know, we can always get a dewdrop of it, a smidgen of it. But the more that, I, I, I truly believe this, I think the more that we practice this, this whole thing of breaking down this conventionality of how we view the world, how we, how we perceive the world, I think if we can start questioning how we perceive the world, we can break down those barriers and eventually come to understanding the vastness and the wider perspective that is basically unlimited to us. So, so to know one can lead to the other. And Nagarjuna believed that by meditating on shunyata, one could <coughs> attain liberation. He didn't feel that it was just for, you know, it was only for certain people. It was for everybody. You just had to work at it. And, you know, I, I'm going to share a little bit. I, I've been working with this, um, these verses for some time. And, in fact, I, I, John had asked me if I'd give a talk, and I gave him one title. And I said, wait a minute, I really want to talk about this, because I've been working with this, these verses and so forth. And I've had a couple of ex ex experiences where, you know, I'll be sitting and meditating, and then, you know, I'll look out my window and have this moment where I realize the suchness of a tree. And there's no big bells or whistles going on. It's not like, ah, liberation, you know? And then it goes back to normal. Perception goes right back to normal. But we've all had that. I'm sure we've all had it. It's part of the human experience. We all have the potential to have that experience. So, you know, he talks about the fact that by meditating on shunyata, we can all attain liberation. But liberation doesn't have to be this kind of thing where the heavens open up and there's angels singing, you know, or Buddhists chanting. You know, it could just be that sliver of a moment where suddenly, wow, that tree and the treeness of that tree, that wow moment. And it, what it is, is it's just switching, it's just changing your perception. And what I found afterwards is that there's that sense of calm abiding. Everything for just a few seconds is really okay with the world. And it's really, you start, you start your whole day. I mean, if you start your day that way, it's like the whole day, it, the mind keeps coming back to that. You know, when things start getting stressed, you go back to that moment. So the conventional reality is believing that there is one cause and one effect. Now, as I said before, we can't know. We, we can say how much we know somebody, but we don't really know them. Now, this is the conventional reality. We always say that the that majority of people believe that, you know, if something goes wrong, it's somebody's fault. In fact, it was interesting. I was watching a clip. Um, I was watching the Dalai Lama speak about emptiness. And he talked about cause and effect. And he started bringing in the whole thing about George Bush, which I thought was very funny. He started talking about George W. Bush and how he went and after Saddam Hussein, because Saddam Hussein was the cause of 9-11 and blah, blah, blah. And it was kind of funny to listen to this man who's speaking about this very sublime topic and putting it into real world terms. And he said, but he didn't, he, and the Dalai Lama saying, he didn't think about the fact that, you know, it's not just Saddam Hussein, it's Saddam Hussein, the people that are in charge of the army, and it's all of his generals, and it's, you know, the thought, and, and it's, it's, it's so multifolded. It's not just one person who's, you know, in charge of 9-11, whether you believe it or not. But he said that there's, there's so many causes and so many effects. And it's sort of this, this role. It just keeps on going. You've got effects that create more causes. And you've got causes that create more effects. And it just keeps on going on and on. And you know, we don't ever, we don't ever think about that. Especially when we're stressed out, we never think about it. And we often believe that what we see is how it is. We never think about, wow, well, what could have happened? 
there's an accident and you watch two cars crash at an intersection and you think, gosh, that one driver, what a moron. You know, they didn't even see the light and they just went right through the light and they hit that car and they damaged those people. But you have no idea. That person could have been having a heart attack. They could have been having a dizzy spell. You just don't know. All we, all we, what we believe is what we see in front of us. And we don't understand the gap that happens between what really happened and the appearance of what happened. We normally don't question it. We just say, this is what it is. So fixed mind is usually that that person should have, they should have, would have, could have, they must have, they must have, they has to have been, they should have, they supposedly did. It's all these, it's all these limited ways of looking at the world. And that's fixed mind. We're grounded in that fixed <clears throat> mind. You know, we, we have a hard time letting go enough. And uh, Pema Chodron talks about lumping. We lump everything together. You know, she talks about the body. We look at the body, not as these are my fingers, and this is my hand, and this is my palm, and this is my wrist, and all the bones that are inside of this wrist and the bones that are connected to be able to make my my fingers wiggle she says no we lump it all together and we say this is my body and she does a very cute you know she's a tiny little thing so she when she lumps she does this whole bodily expression it's actually quite funny she looks like a little ball of clay but um but we do we do that when we're not feeling well you know it's, it, we don't really sit and think about, okay, what is it that's really not feeling well? We don't break it down. We just say, I'm not feeling well. Because we're very, very stuck on the I am. I am, we have to, we're very stuck on the self. It's the I am, it's the me making. The world revolves according to who we are. That's how we see the world. It's based on this whole concept of I am, I'm here. And, you know, somebody slights us or gets upset with us and, you know, we feel insulted. Because how could they talk to me like that? And this whole thing of being stuck in this thing of I am and me and mine and so forth is what creates our su stress and our suffering. And it also pulls in our energy. If, you, if you've ever noticed your body when you're tense or you're stressed or you're upset, you pull in, but when you're really happy and everything's right with the world, your whole energy field expands. You're open to other people. So, you know, when, when we pull in, we, our mind starts putting up all the barriers, all the defenses, and we become very close-minded. So just quickly, the dewdrop of the ultimate reality is being able to see past what's in front of one seeing the unity of everything that's around you through the interdependence. I've talked about this earlier. Understanding and questioning the conceptual framework we live in. My big thing is always saying, who says? I say this to clients all the time. They'll say, well, my mom, well, I can't do that. Well, who says you can't? Whose voice are you listening to? Whose voice is that? Who says? You know, who says there's God? And no offense to anybody who believes in God, but who says there's God? Have you experienced it? You know, even the Dalai Lama says, investigate everything. Krishnamurti, investigate everything. Question everything. Theosophical society, question everything. Open your mind. Look into it. Find out for yourself. So ask yourself, who says so? So meditation on the interdependence and the impermanence can lead to suchness. And I just talked about that with regard to the tree. You know, it's just this whole thing that this tree came from a nut from the seed of another tree that has died and became fertilizer in the ground. And that tree just has part of that energy and it just grows and it's just there. And there's so much that it's connected to. It's connected to the rain and the deer and the fertilizer that the deer provide and you know all the little creatures, that creature, the creepy crawlers. So that suchness is known also as the Buddha nature. And in Nagarjuna's teachings, he talks about that the Buddha nature is not physical, emotional, conceptual, impulsive, conscious, or anything else. It does not dwell in us, nor we in it. It does not own us. 
So in other words, suchness or Buddha nature is empty. It's empty in itself. And emptiness is also empty. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to run through a couple of um, Nagarjuna's teachings um, from the verses of the center. I wanted to just um, read these out. And you know, we'll, we'll get through a couple of them. And then I thought maybe we could share what we're experiencing by, by reading them out. You know, so it's going to be a little bit of a, a, a bit of a meditation. So, you know, if you can just get to that place where you can just be present <laughs> um, and get in, into that, that mindset. Um, so he says one of, the, one of the verses is, In seeing things, to be or not to be, fools fail to see a world at ease. We worry about, is this, is this it, or isn't this it? What difference does it make? To see things existing by nature is to see them without causes or conditions. And from what I understand how they're discussing this is nature, we look at nature as this, this entity this, that has, this, has no cause and doesn't come from anywhere. It's its, o it's, its own inherent existence, which, they, which he says this doesn't exist. So to th see things existing by nature is to see them without causes or conditions, thus subverting causality, because everything is cause and effect. Agents, tools, and acts, starting, stopping, and ripening. Contingency is emptiness which contingently configured is the middle way. Everything is contingent. Everything is empty. <clears throat> and then there's a whole section on contingency. Some of these are full verses, and some of them are partial, because some of the verses go on. Um, and I should probably mention this first. So this was the book that I used. I used Verses from the Center by Stephen Batchelor, if you're interested in getting a copy of it. He did a wonderful job of creating this, explaining the verses in a very poetic form, which was very, very meditative. So that's, that's where these verses are coming from. So blocked by confusion, I forge a destiny with impulsive acts. Consciously, I enter situations where personality unfolds and world impacts on a sensitive soul. Personality creates consciousness. Just as attention, the eye, and a colorful shape trigger vision. Impact is the meeting of consciousness, sense, and world. It leads to experience I crave to have and avoid. Craving makes me cling at senses opinions, rules, and selves. Clinging is to insist on being someone. Not to cling is to be free, to be no one. To be someone is to be a conscious, impulsive, thinking, feeling body, which is born, ages, dies, suffers torment, grief and pain, depression and anxiety. Anguish emerges when someone is born. Impulsive acts are the root of life. Fools are impulsive. The wise see things as they are. When confusion stops through insight, impulsive acts cease. Stop this, and that will not happen. Anguish will end. So it's, um, it's, really, it's really quite amazing, because in one verse, he taught, he, doesn't mention self at all. There's no self. It's the whole action. It's the whole attention to action. What is actually happening? There's no I when we're seeing something. It's a, it's a process. It's attention to action. It's the I and the consciousness of the I connecting with the object that the consciousness is connecting to. 
Does anyone have any comments? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, all the verses are very interesting and they kind of lead to one and the other. And then there is one that I stopped there and then it says, where it says, um, fools are impulsive. Oh, impulsive acts are the root of life. But this is a little bit contra contradictory because to me life is a positive thing, mm -hmm. but then it says that after that, fools are impulsive. So, but that leads to life, or I got a little bit like, mm. Well, I do wonder Thank you. with regard to how this is written and how it's transcribed, because from what I understand, it was first in Sanskrit, then it went to Chinese, then it went to Tibetan. So I'm sure along the way, <laughs> has anyone ever played telephone? <laughs> so I do wonder, and I have done this. I've done the same kind of thing. I've looked at it and said, okay, what do they really mean? What do they really mean by that? But I wonder if it's supposed to be about how um, it could be looked at two ways. Impulsive acts are the root of life in the sense that life can't happen without impulsivity. It has to be that that moment, that divine spark, it has to happen. But at the same time, when you become attached to the impulsivity, because there's a consciousness, you're not really seeing the world very clearly, then you're living on impulsivity. So that's one way to look at it. The other way that I looked at it also is the fact that, you know, the Four Noble Truths, all life is suffering. And I actually went to a different, I went and was listening to Thanissaro Bhikkhu. Has anyone ever heard of him? Um, but I was listening to one of his, or reading one of his writings about emptiness. And he used the word stress instead of suffering. And that sort of makes it more relatable, doesn't it? Because not all of us feel like we're suffering. I don't feel like I'm suffering. I think I got it pretty good, you know, I'm pretty happy with life. But when he changed it to stress, it kind of took on a different meaning because I was like, wow, yeah, I could relate to that. Did you have a comment, sir? Yeah, those two lines also kind of caught my attention. Um, the way I'm interpreting is that um, the impulsive acts is the source of energy, mm -hmm. and the fools, that energy identify with the personal self, then they get impulsive, and then the wise, they see, they witness that as an energy, source of energy, not identify with it, that's why they see mm -hmm. as they are. That's a nice way of putting it. There's a comment here. And I have other slides, so, because <laughs> I brought other verses, so. Um, uh, not to overimpose my views on it, but it seems to be something more about transcending uh, the physical being or the, the mechanical, biological being and trying to reach the state of Godhead. Uh, the, the first two lines are the only lines that contain uh, a possessive or a personal pronoun. Uh, everything else is objective. So uh, if you look at it from that context, uh, you can see towards the end that it it seems the message is that if you can leave behind the biologically motivated impulsive acts and, uh, and consciously connect with the Godhead, uh, you eliminate or reduce your likelihood to be a victim of those impulsive acts. You act with in line with the, the Godhead and not uh, in line with your strictly isolated physical being. Mm -hmm. It's moving from the partial, it's moving from the partial truth to the ultimate. And that's one of the things that, um, I'm trying to think of who it was that I was listening to, or maybe I was reading about this, that, oh, it was about the Buddha, and, and about his teaching about emptiness. He, talk, he talked about it from a very, very practical level. 
Very, very simple level. And you know, this can get very heady. We could get real, and I've read those too. You could get real caught up. There's a lot of scholars out there that have taken on Nagarjuna's teachings and made them into just huge discourses and talked about Kant and compared it to Kant and Hegel and you know the impermanence and beingness and so forth. And you can get completely caught up in all of that. And my favorite ones when I was listening to anything about emptiness was from the Buddhists who really didn't speak very good English and talked about it in a very simple fashion. Because I do think that that's that's symbolic of how it should be looked at. We can't get too caught up in, in the headiness of it. We really have to have it be a, an experiential kind of process. So this is, a, this is somewhat of a, I don't know, I, I picked this one because I think it's something we all do. We all walk. Walking does not start in steps taken or to come or in the act itself, where does it begin? Before I raise a foot, is there motion, a step, to, a step take, or to come when walking could begin? What has gone, what moves, what is to come? It should be a step taken, sorry. You know, and this is, such a, this is such a beautiful verse about mindfulness. You know, there's walking meditation that many people do. And it's that whole thing about being conscious before you're even taking that step. Pema Chodron talks about being conscious of every single motion that you're making. She talks about going and getting gas, you know, and you're driving the car and you pull up to the gas station. You have to put your foot on the brake and you have to put the car into park. Then you have to take the keys out of the ignition and you have to open the car door. You know, and it goes on like that. And in our daily life, we don't do that. We, we you know, we're, I gotta get gas, <laughs> you know? We're not, we're not sitting there thinking about, okay, this is what I'm doing. And I, and I remember doing this. I remember when I was raising my children and, you know, I was, um, I was a happily married single mom because my, my husband at the time worked a lot and he was never home. And I got very tired of, of being home all the time with my children. And so I found this book called The Tao of Parenting. And it talked about that whole thing of being mindful when you're with your children. Because we want, the stress that comes from anything is because we want it a certain way and it's not like that. But when we're able to see every moment and look at that moment individually, the mind slows down. And you savor every moment. And it's, it's, it's important that, at least to me, I think it's important if we're walking a spiritual path that we try to exercise that at least for a few moments a day where we're really conscious, whether we're eating our food, washing a dish, you know, sweeping the floor, feeding our animals, it's just important to be in that moment and be conscious of what you're doing. And it's amazing how you don't make any mistakes when you're paying attention to what you're doing. <laughs> Unlike me who was writing up this PowerPoint and ended up putting in a typo. You could tell that I was not paying attention. And then having the humility to say, I made a mistake. Does anyone have any comments on this one? It is beautiful, isn't it? I really recommend that, um, you know, if you have an iPad, I don't know if this is a, it's got a Kindle version to it. I'm sure that it does or something. But it really is 
it's a beautiful book just to read the verses, and you only have to read one. I mean, some of them are very long, and then they're in paragraphs. I, for time's sake, I ended up writing some of them out. Um, most of them are in this format. Um, and this was actually just a snippet of walking. These are only three of the, of the full verse. So it's much longer than this. But it's a great meditation. It's a great meditation. This one is really quite interesting. Am I already here before I see and taste and feel? If not, how could I see, taste, and feel? How can I know if I'm already here or not? If I were here without them, they could be here without me. I reveal them, and they reveal me. How can I be here without them? How can they be here without me? I am not already here before the experience as such. Seeing reveals the seer, tasting just the taster, feeling just the feeler. Were they different, I would be legion, which means grouped or lumped. Nor am I tucked inside the elements when seeing and tasting and feeling unfold. If I to whom these things belong cannot be found, how can they be found? I do not precede them, nor am I with them, nor do I follow them. Let go of I am, let go of I am not. Are there any comments? I really like the let go of I am and let go of I am not. That's what seems to happen when, when one meditates. Yeah, same thing that let go of I am, let go of I am not. Who is that that's letting go or letting not go? <laughs> it is, it, this one, um, always struck me with how interdependent it, it bring the how it brings out the interdependence of an act. There's the taster and the tasting. The object that tastes. And that's all a process. Where's the self in any of that? There's no self in any of that. It's it's an act that's happening. This one is on the self. What is mine when there is no me? I love that line. Were self-centeredness eased, I would not think of me and mine. There would be no one there to think of them. What is inside is me, what is outside is mine. When these thoughts end, compulsion stops. Repetition ceases and freedom dawns. Fixations spawn thoughts that provoke compulsive acts. Emptiness stops fixations. This is from that book too? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, all of these, all of these are from this uh, verses from the center by Stephen Batchelor. And this is only um, this is only part of the verse of on self. It was actually very difficult to put this PowerPoint together because I kept thinking, oh, I should put that one. Oh, I should put that one. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> but it, I think that the best thing to do is for you to get the book and to read the verses yourself. And of course, the experience I had is going to be different from the experience you have. So, but I do really, really recommend it. I, I, I'm. I love how it just sort of stops the mind for a moment. Yeah, so all of these are from Verses of the Center, A Buddhist Vision of the Sublime by Stephen Batchelor. That's this book here. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but from what I had read, um, Nagarjuna was very, um, Ashanti Deva was very impressed by Nagarjuna's teachings on Verses of the Center, and that's how a guide to the Bodhisattva way came into being, which I thought was just, because I absolutely love this book as well. If you haven't read this book, it's really good. Um, the other book that I was really recommending is um, It's Up to You by Designar Control Rinpoche. And I came, actually, I think that the process started with him. He's written this book about the self-reflection of the Buddhist path, and it's not even about Buddhism. It's about self-reflection, which pertains to any of us who are walking this path. But he puts it in such a simple way for the everyday person that I've actually recommended this book to so many people and I've given it away as Christmas gifts to everybody. And I haven't gotten one bad review about it. And my ex-husband is a type AAA personality and he's reading it and he loves it. He says, wow, it makes me slow down. And, you know, and I just sit there with it every day. And the other thing that I found, and this is how I related this to theosophy, because right now we're studying the voice of the silence um, with another group. And so much of the voice of the silence relates to what we're talking about here. And it's, it's amazing, of course, the voice of the silence is supposed, is, um, it's a, it stems from the golden verses you know, and that's supposed to be a Buddhist text. Um, but I, it's, it's amazing to me as we're reading the voice of the silence how much that has to do with the Prajna Paramita Sutras and then how much it has to do with the um, Madhyamaka verses and so forth. It's, uh, it's just amazing and how, how much of it is theosophical, how it all relates to the, the you know, to theosophy itself. So. Are there any questions? Well, how do you like them apples? It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give one more uh, stab at defining emptiness as it's used here? How would you, how would you define the term? Like in the last line, I think it was the last line of the last of the last verse, emptiness stops fixations. Mm -hmm. So what is it then that stops fixations? We become fixated, and I'm going to, and that, anyone is welcome to jump in. You're welcome to jump in, because I know that there's a group here who, you know, this is your field. It's not really my field. I'm really getting new at this. Um, but we get, we, we cling to, we cling to how things are. Um, Pema Chodron calls it fixed mind. You know, we, we, get, we get fixated on how we perceive the world believing that that's right. And, and we all do this. We just don't know that we do it. We all do it. So, um, I'm trying to think of an example. And I, I, it's best to relate to myself. So a couple of days ago, I had sent emails out and text messages out. And I didn't get any response for like the whole day. My phone didn't ring. Nothing dinged. No emails came through. 
I actually had some friend of mine call me saying, you know, I wonder if my phone's broken. And then I sat with it for a while because I started getting a little irritated because I was like, well, you know, I'm expecting these answers and where are these people and why aren't they responding? So what happens is, is that because of the lifestyle that we lead, you know, we have these cell phones, we have these emails, and we have this instantaneous way of communicating with each other. When it doesn't happen, we start thinking something's wrong. Then we start thinking something's wrong with us. Sorry, guys. I know I hit the mic. I, I can hear Chris in the background going, damn, Anya. <laughs> but we do. We, we start relating it back to us. And there could be a thousand reasons why the emails didn't come through. And of course, I got answers two days later. I mean, people are busy. But at that moment, I wanted an answer right away. Now, why I wanted an answer right away, I have no idea. Maybe I was feeling, huh? Because you are in that moment. Yeah, I'm in that moment. I'm in that moment where I'm in work mode, and I want answers right away. You know, that was one of it. And that was one of the reasons. There probably was another. I'm sure astrologically something was going on. You know, Mars was beating down somebody's door. I don't know. But what happens is, is that we have this perception of the world and that we cling to that. That's how we know who we are. And it's only when we can step back from that and realize that there's this whole inter there's this whole other world going on outside of ourselves then we can stop being fixated on ourselves cuz the minute we start you know another example is and and I hope my girlfriend doesn't mind me using her as the example but um I hadn't heard from her for days normally she's my best friend I normally talk to her like every day but lately I haven't heard from her for a lot for quite some time and, um, and I started feeling a little upset, you know, because I've been sending her text messages. How are you? How are things going? She had moved into a house, and, you know, she had all this other stuff going on, and I just wanted to be supportive. So I was sending her messages and asking her how she's doing, and I didn't hear from her. I kept thinking, God, she must be angry with me. I wonder if I said something wrong. Or, you know, or something really bad happened. Like, your mind just kind of goes off in a thousand different directions. Finally, she sent me a text message. And she said, my parents are both in the hospital. My mom's in ho on hospice. I don't really have the energy to do anything. You know, she's, her whole other world, this whole other world is going on for her. There's all these causes and effects that are taking place in her life. And in turn, because I'm fixated on me, you know, I sat there and I went, wow, OK. I need to stop doing this. This is really kind of selfish on my part. I have to stop making it about me. And, and it was interesting because I caught myself enough that she's supposed to come with me to Louisiana. We're doing a presentation down there, and she has to cancel. She can't come. So I wrote her this, you know, I am so sorry. Please let me know if there's anything I can do for you, that kind of thing. But when you start seeing how everything is interdependently related, that fixation just starts breaking away. It makes you take a step back. And in that turn, that you realize that it's not this one cause, it's not this one effect, it's not this one thing. It's all interrelated. And when it's all interrelated, it has no one inherent existence. And that's why it's called emptiness. Joan Halifax and her mm -hmm. companion um, re reworded the interpretation of emptiness to include boundlessness. That's a good one. Because what it does is then it takes fixations which have a kind of a boundaries around it and blows it out. Right. Because, you know, the word emptiness is kind of just an interpretation in English we've been using for a long time. Right. People are starting to question how it relates. And we have a concept of what emptiness means. Yes. We so have I think this, that's, that's a key factor. Yeah. We, we keep looking at it as something where there's nothing there. And it's not about nothingness. It's about breaking down the barriers. 
And so boundlessness is a perfect one. Also, I've been noticing um, one of the more recent translations now expands on the notion of compassion being at the roots of emptiness. Um, Alanyo, there's a new translation he's done on in that, and I think that's really a key factor because when you get fixated on yourself, you tend to get lost in the sense of, which is one of the key principles of Buddhism. Right. There is no self. Right. And so I think this is why I think other translations bring some of these other terms yeah. in at some point. No, I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And you know, it's funny because the Dalai Lama talks about the same thing. He says, you know, when you stop thinking about yourself, then you start thinking about everyone else. And when you're thinking about everyone else, you're not thinking about yourself. And it's one of the best ways to step outside of yourself and actually practice compassion in the world. Uh, one example that comes to my mind on that passage is uh, sky and the Chicago weather. The sky is emptiness, it's a boundless thing. But when it comes to, the, it should not be this cold this time of the year, we are fixating yeah. the sky into <laughs> so, the weather. And who's to say it's not supposed <laughs> yeah, to be that cold right. this time of the and year? And if we think of sky, the sky is same like Chicago last year and this year. There's right. no effect. But our own notion of the weather, it should not be this, it should right. be that. Right. That fixation comes to when we relate to the cloud and weather, but that fixation goes away if we go beyond the clouds and weather and identify, I mean, um, if you think of sky, then suddenly the fixation goes away. Mm -hmm. The clouds and weather goes away. So it's, it's very interesting that, but we are so used to forget the sky, caught up in the weather and uh, yeah. in the conditions. Because weather, weather is nothing but a, a drama of pressure, temperature, humidity, and uh, right. velocity. It's happening. It, it, it's happening what it needs to happen. Right. And we get caught up in that and get fixed up and get all uptight about the whole thing. But if we can relax into the boundless sky, mm -hmm. everything is fine. Thank you. <laughs>